Hello and welcome to part two of our Conditional Access Authentication Strengths video series, where we're going to talk to you all about Entra ID's Authentication Strengths feature. In this video, we're going to explain how Authentication Strengths works with Conditional Access, how you can troubleshoot issues with sign-in, and how you can monitor usage of Authentication Strengths in your tenant. I'm Grace Picking, a product manager in the Entra ID customer engineering team, and I'm partnered today with Inbar. Hey, everyone. My name is Ian Barsizer-Grinsky. I'm a principal product manager working on Microsoft Entra ID, focusing on identity security. Grace, uh, to kick us off, can you talk a little bit about uh, what do we evaluate during the user sign-in? It's a great question. So, um, conditional access policies are all evaluated at exactly the same time. Um, and when we look at a user that's requesting authentication access to a, a resource, we evaluate many things, including whether uh, that user's in scope of a request, whether the application's in scope, um, as well as their location, their device, um, and their browser, as well as their risk status through identity protection. Now, when a user is accessing a resource, um, there is a number of different things that we would check and they're ultimately done in the same order. However, we also go always go with the most restrictive. And so when we're talking about authentication strengths requirements, a user may already have authenticated, they may already have a token. However, um, at the point that they requested that token, they may not have been asked to perform MFA because depending on the original conditional access policy, it may not have been required. So the first thing that we do is if you have a policy that requires auth strength, we evaluate what's already been done and what we can already see. So we will have a look at what is required of this new authentication request um, and evaluate that against your policy. So as we showed in part one, it may be that a user requires fish resistant MFA and they may only have performed SMS MFA before, for example. So we will evaluate that against also if that user has that method registered to them, because of course they can't perform a register a method that they haven't registered against themselves. Um, and then also we'll have a look at those previously used methods. Um, and so in bar, when we're talking about this, um, what if a user hasn't registered a method and they are required to uh, fulfill a fish resistant uh, method? That's a great question. And that basically takes me into the signing results. So depending on the situation, whether they register the method, where they um, use the method, um, where they um, are not allowed to use the method, we have a few different options of what would be the signing results. Um, and let's deep dive into all of them, uh, including uh, addressing your questions about what if the user have not registered the method. So let's start with uh, the simple uh, case of a user who is allowed to use the method, it is required by the authentication method policy, by the authentication strength policy, the user registered the method, but they haven't used that in the session before. So what happens is that we will basically prompt the user and require, for example, FIDO2 um, authentication. So conditional access is evaluated post-primary authentication. Once the user have done the first authentication, we will run conditional access and prompt them for the relevant authentication methods. Uh, an important caveat here is that some methods are available in as a first factor or primary authentication versus some methods that are available only as second factor. So for example, password, Windows Store for Business will only be available um, as a, a primary authentication versus method like FIDO2 uh, certificate based authentication, they're both available as first factor and second factor. So we can prompt for those methods no matter where the user is in their um, journey. For external users, uh, I mentioned it a little bit um, on our previous um, uh, session. Um, external users can either do the variety of methods that we allow by combining authentication strength with um, cross tenant access setting and requiring the user to authenticate on the home tenant. Or if we require the user to authenticate on the resource tenant, they can use any of the methods that are available as second factor. So that could be SMS, uh, push, um, hardware and software auth, and so on. And then finally, for federated users, if you decide that you still want the users to authenticate on their federated IDP, for example, ADFS, we do accept MFA claim from the um, external IDP and respect that in authentication strength. So we, we, we wouldn't know which method the user have used on ADFS, but if you're sending the MFA claim 
from ADFS to Entry ID, you will respect that in condition access authentication strings. So the next one is the registration case, and that's actually going back to your question, Grace. So what happened when the user is not registered for the method? Well, we take them to register the method, and we allow them to satisfy the authentication strengths after they register the method. So we will take the user to the security info wizard mode, or also known as the interrupt mode, where the user can click on kind of next, next, and go through experience of registering multiple authentication methods. They will also need to meet the authentication strengths requirement in order to register methods. So if you, for example, configure a condition access policy with authentication strengths to only allow temporary access pass and phishing resistant method for the security info, they will have to use one of these methods in order to go and register another method. So if it's a new user, it's important to give them the temporary access pass before they're going and registering the method. Otherwise, they're basically um, blocked from um, signing in. I want to call out also a few of the consideration of the passwordless and phishing resistant method registration. So for passwordless uh, phone signing with authentic error, uh, users have to go to their phone in order to register the, uh, the method. So we have to make sure that the user is actually uh, going outside of the signing flow, maybe registering in advance in order to be able to um, access the resource. For phishing resistant methods like uh, FIDO2 or now passkeys, we are actually going to um, support passkey registration in the wizard mode so users can go and register it in that mode. Certificate based authentication uh, is actually not registered by the user, it's depending on the admin placing a cert or pushing a certificate to the user's device in order to be able to use certificate based authentication. So, um, as an admin, you want to prepare for that in advance. And uh, finally, Windows of Business, the registration happens outside of the, um, the wizard mode or the security info. It actually happens in the um, UBI flow or um, from the Windows uh, security settings where you can register the, the method. So depending on the method you are deploying, you may want to think, think about the different uh, registration considerations. Now, keep in mind there are some other policies that could apply um, for registration. We have um, self service password reset or SSPR in short uh, that could apply on the user sign in and might require them to register methods. So, in addition to authentication strengths requiring the user to register a specific method, keep in mind that there are other um, method registration policies. So, for example, self service password reset or SSPR for short, may require the user to register methods that are applicable for password reset. And identity protection uh, legacy policy have the ability to require um, MFA registration outside of um, the condition access policies. And if this is new to you uh, and you're not sure how your end users may be requiring or allowed to register, make sure you go and have a look and also engage with your security teams, your risk team, uh, your ops team and your end user comms team to make sure that if you are going to make a change to the policy, um, because it would be end user impacting, that you make all these teams aware and you can make the right decision for your users and your security posture so that they're, you're also not leaving yourself exposed to potential loopholes for registration, but equally you're not uh, making it unnecessarily difficult or putting too many blockers in place where actually your users may not be able to register in the first place and actually end up getting blocked. So uh, that's actually a great segue for my next one, which is a block access, which can be a result of an authentication strengths uh, policy. So first reason why a user may be blocked is that um, they're basically not allowed, like either by uh, the authentication method policy does not allow them to use the method and authentication strengths. So uh, that's a great segue for my next um, talking point, which is about when is user blocked from access. So there could be a few reasons why a user is blocked from access. First of all is the user is not allowed to use the required method. So let's say um, the authentication strengths policy allowed them to require um, FIDO2 or temporary access pass, but they currently don't have temporary access pass or they're not allowed by the authentication method policy to use FIDO2. So at this point, they're unable to move forward. My second point goes back to the um, idea of some methods are available as first factor versus some methods are available as second factor. So if you want to require Windows Store for Business, but the user started to sign in with um, a password, for example, they may end up in a block situation because we're unable to prompt them for Windows Store for Business. Um, in this case, the user will get a friendly uh, end user error message instructing them to restart the session and choosing Windows Hello for Business. 
The next one is about going back to the registration point, which is the user might have not registered a passwordless method. And again, going back to different consideration of registration of those methods for the different methods, um, you may want to make sure that the user is registering for passwordless consign in advance. If it's a certificate based authentication that you place the certificate on the user device and so on, so they can actually go and um, sign in with those methods. And finally, if we are using, uh, if we're talking about the FIDO2 or passkey restrictions for specific A goods, um, if the user have used uh, a key which doesn't meet those criteria, we will obviously block them and not allow their access. So these were the different options um, to, for the sign-in results. Now, Grace, can you um, walk us through how an admin can actually troubleshoot authentication strengths policy and why a user is blocked? Definitely. So it's really important that when you are um, launching a new conditional access policy is that you know where to look to understand exactly how this is impacting the end user. So in all cases, for any conditional access policy, all the auth details are captured within the Entra ID sign-in logs. When you go into a specific sign-in log for a user, you will get a number of very detailed bits of information about that user. But specifically, when you're uh, triaging and having a look at um, authentication strengths, you want to go into the authentication details blade and it will tell you uh, which policies have been applied for authentication strengths and even down to the results detail of what requirement was being fulfilled and whether it had succeeded or not. Because to Imbar's point previously, if a user has been blocked, then succeeded will say false. And you'll be able to see here exactly why that user was not able to meet the requirements of the policy. When you go into a little bit further into the conditional access policy details blade, you can even see under the specific grant controls, not just the authentication strengths requirements, which were or weren't met, but others as part of that request from that conditional access policy that were or weren't met. And so you can see here a number of things. We can see the information about the user, the application, the risk of that user, the location, the platform, the app itself, the device, um, and also the overall user risk as well as sign-in risk. And so this is really good if you've got a user on the end of the phone and they just cannot get their head around why they're being blocked or limited or requested for registration, this is where you should go. Hopefully though, uh, before you get to the point of having issues, it's all about planning and designing how an authentication strict conditional access policy would impact your end users, because you want to be successful. So you wanna, um, as builders would say, measure twice, cut once. So for the first measurement, once you've done a bit of thinking around how and what use scenarios you may want to require different or strengths based on that low, medium, high uh, risk of your applications that we went through in the first video, is you can use our what if uh, matrix to apply some sample and emulate a user sign in process and see under the policy uh, what authentication method would be prompted and why. Once you're happy with the output of what if, you can then move into planning through a conditional access policy in report only mode and then moving it to enforce. And of course, when you move into enforce, you can also scope it to different users and groups. If you don't want to do a big bang release, you can do a phase approach. Once you have that conditional access policy on, you can have a look within our conditional access monitoring dashboard within the conditional access overview in the Microsoft Entra admin portal. And this goes down into the specific details of where under all strengths, um, how many uh, user requests and how many um, policies were applied for say fish resistant MFA. And it allows you to uh, understand if in terms of usage, if this is what you are expecting or not, and also monitor how the usage grows as you roll out uh, your new policies. In addition to the inbuilt templates um, and dashboards that you can see within the Microsoft Entra admin portal, uh, all of our Entra ID sign-in logs have the ability to be exported to your scene. And that includes the very detailed all strengths requirements uh, that may or may not have been filled as part of a sign-in request. So it's important that if you are exporting your logs to a scene, that you make sure that these all of these logs are included and that they're being monitored and reported on, especially if you're relying on your help desk staff uh, to be able to assess 
uh, the usage of this or to be able to troubleshoot why a user is being blocked um, or how they're unable to register um, a new form of authentication strength um, against their registered security information. So with that, I'll hand back to Imbar to leave you with some homework. Thanks, Grace. So I want to share a little bit of how uh, resources we have um, if you want to take the next step and start deploying. Um, first of all, we have the AKMS slash authentication strength docs, which is um, our public documentation that goes in much more detail into the why and how things work. We have the API, um, authentication strengths API docs, um, in case you actually want to take a programmatic approach and use um, our API to, re to uh, create and update those policies. And finally, if you ask yourself, what is this phishing resistance that they have been talking about all session, we have a great session here um, at AKMS slash fish resistant explain that talks about um, the behind the scene of what makes Windows all over business certificate versus authentication and file to uh, and pass keys uh, phishing resistant. So thank you very much for joining us today in our part two video all about authentication strengths and conditional access policies as part of Microsoft Entra ID. We'd love to hear your feedback, so feel free to comment on this video if you have any questions and follow up on the resources that we added in the links previously. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.